Excellent. Fantastic. Let's get started then. Um, so uh, it's a pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Tom Go or G on this this slide, um, and he will be telling us about quantum learning algorithms and how they imply circuit lower bounds. Thank you very much, Ashley. Um, so um, this is a joint work with Sunil Hassan, Arun Khacharam, um, Alex Guerrillo, Igor Oliveira, and Arti Sandaram. And as the title of the paper and the talk um, kind of hints, the main message of what I'm going to show to you is that quantum learning algorithms, well, they imply circuit law. So let's jump right uh, into it. So um, just to me, this was quite surprising. This, this work um, falls in the intersection of three different fields and somehow tie them in a very natural way. So these three fields are quantum algorithms. Uh, you know, well, the main goal perhaps is to achieve quantum speed ups. Um, we're dealing with learning theory, the, the theoretical foundations of uh, machine learning um, in which we want to design these fast and efficient learning algorithms. And on the other side, we have um, complexity theory, which is the, the, the bad boy of the bunch, which instead of like trying to do positive thing, then a large part of it is concerned with um, understanding the limits of computation and the limits of algorithms. Um, and we see how these three topics are um, very tightly connected. Now, since this is a QAP talk, um, I'm assuming some uh, background in quantum algorithms, but uh, very little in learning theory and complexity theory. Okay. So, um, I'd like to start actually with the take home message, the, the most important thing that I, um, I want to communicate using, during this talk. And that's uh, the following thing, that any marginal improvement on trivial quantum learners, and I will mention exactly what I mean by trivial pretty soon. So any marginal improvement on these trivial quantum learners will imply these strong breakthrough circuit lower bounds um, in, in complexity theory. Now it really depends on which type of person you are. If you are um, a you know, glass half full kind of person, then you can say perhaps this is a new and exciting path to show um, strong lower bounds using the power and the expressivity of quantum computing. You know, so all we have to do is to use the, the, like the power of quantum algorithm to get this, this tiny, tiny improvement, and that would give us these amazing um, lower bounds. And if you're um, a glass half empty uh, person, then this perhaps could explain why it's so difficult to get um, and design probably correct quantum uh, learning algorithms. Okay, so um, I'd like to start with just the, the better necessity that we need to know uh, in complexity theory and circuit level bounds. So um, as I'm sure you all know, we have the uh, million dollar question of P versus NP. It's quite um, ridiculously, literally a million dollar problem because of the Clay Institute. Um, but this is something that's been um, harassing us for decades and decades. Can we take the problems that are um, you know, efficiently solvable versus the problems that are efficiently verifiable, and can we get a separation here? And now, um, after anyone who tried thinking about this problem, we soon reach um, a lot of difficulties, and, and it seems that we are, you know, very, very, very far from having the technical tools to, that needed to take this um, separation. And so, one approach, um, which kind of like rocketed in the 80s, uh, but in fact it dates back to the days of Shannon in, in Shannon in 1984, is that of circuit complexity. So we know um, in, in this setting, you know, the, the main object of computation is a circuit, so we have some inputs, um, let's say S1 to Xn, and we wire them into gates, and this gate can be, for example, not, or, and, and so forth. And um, it would be useful to introduce this notation where by C, um, fancy script C, I will talk about a uh, circuit class. 
and that would be what type of circuits it could be maybe constant depth maybe the type of uh, circuit of gates that are allowed and so forth and sn would be the size like for example the number of um, gates as a function of the number of arguments and, and the big idea here is that while Turing machines and, and algorithms are abstract, complex um, things to analyze, circuits are simple combinatorial objects. And, and in some sense, we can just think about them as, as graphs, labeled graphs. Um, now, on the one hand, there is something nice about circuits that um, this is a non uniform mode, uh, model of computation, which means that uh, we need to define a circuit per input length just because we, we have to wire, we have to connect the wires and, and so forth. And on the one hand, this is simple because it means that if we want to show that a random problem is uh, hard, then a simple count counting argument will show us that you know, a random function would take exponential size circuits to compute. So this is nice. But the downside is that um, this extra freedom of designing a different circuit per input length can cause these weird uh, computational power that we will discuss uh, fairly soon. Okay, so let's continue. Um, now I want to take you back to the 80s. So the 80s were a happy, uh, optimistic time, at least in complexity theory. If you'd open up the radio, you'd probably hear Nina Simone singing, it's a new day, it's a new dawn, and I'm feeling good. And the reason why, um, I'm not sure why she was happy, but uh, why the complexity, theory, the complexity uh, community was so excited is because it seems that we are showing a lot of nice and strong uh, circuit lower bounds. It was, um, you know, it started in 83 and there was a flurry of results and it seems that every year we have, um, you know, major uh, breakthrough. And people went out to the street and celebrated and... Uh, I actually don't know that because I wasn't born, but I always imagined it, like these this happy times. And it seems that we have this, this meteoric rise for circuit lower bounds. And I'm guessing that if you'd ask someone in the late 80s, um, they would tell you that surely you know, P versus NP is, is on, on the horizon. We already have these uh, considered like, limited um, circuits such as AC0, which are circuits of constant depth. We consider monotone polynomial time circuits and we saw lower bound in that setting. And um, things looked very optimistic. Alas, um, in the 90s, um, somehow the, the radio changed its tune. And from here, things went, well, mostly downhill. And as a community, we found ourselves running in circles and, and uh, failing to make like, progress of the same magnitude that we, had, that we had back in the 80s. So, to illustrate that, you know, we have this strong belief that um, NP is not contained in P poly. Well, P poly is just like the class which represents um, polynomial size circuits. I mean, you might say that this is um, trivial, but exactly because of this non-uniformity, it's not entirely clear why this is not, it's not clear at all why this is the case. And um, in fact, we have this strong complexity theoretic evidence, like we'll have a full-blown complexity doomsday um, if we'll have such an inclusion, if it, um, because if, if this doesn't happen, the polynomial hierarchy collapses by the Carpleton theorem, and, and bad things happen. Um, but despite we believe these this strong statements, um, for all we know, then, you know, um, the class NX, non-deterministic exponential time, could have polynomial time circuits. Right? This, this, is, this sounds completely ridiculous, but we just don't know how to prove that this is not the case. And if we're going to the quantum realm, then BQE, which is the exponential time um, analog of BQP, quantum polynomial time, so for all we know, it could have depth to um, threshold circuits, which are a very simple, um, you know, discrete analog of um, neural networks. So we, we strongly believe that this is not the case, but we don't know how to show that. And um, you know, at some time we, we learned to see that circuit lower bounds are just extremely hard to prove. And often it is something, you know, if we see a result that tells us we have, uh, this would imply a circuit lower bound, then at least I'm getting quite intimidated because surely it's too hard to show. Um, and I want to tell you about um, 
a major breakthrough. I, I was a student at the time when this paper came out and, and I, I saw everybody was so, uh, everyone was so excited about it. And that was a result uh, by Ryan Williams, who showed that um, an exp, non-deterministic exponential time, um, is not contained in ACC0. Well, ACC0, it's again, it's like constant depth circuits uh, which have end or not and um, arbitrary modulo gate. So, but the main point I want to say about um, this result is that an X is a huge, huge class and ACC0 is a very restricted um, class of circuits. Yet just finally being able to, to, uh, to show this was um, a, a big breakthrough. And to do that, um, there was a big idea that actually stands at the heart of our work, which is to derive lower bounds from algorithms. And it's a quite a nice idea to think about uh, how we can use positive algorithmic results to show negative results regarding the power of computation. Okay. So um, with complexity behind us, we can finally get to quantum learning theory. And, you know, in the general setting, we're concerned with these problems where, you know, for example, maybe we have um, a lot of photos and we want to know whether they correspond to a cat or dog. And so we want um, an algorithm that would tell us whether a certain uh, picture is, for example, a picture of a cat or of a cat or not. Oh, you know, because these are quantum algorithms, then um, maybe we'll output cat one if it's a cat and cat zero if it's not a cat. Apologies, I couldn't resist the pun. Um, so being a bit more formal about that, uh, in this setting, we have a known class of circuits, C, or hypothesis class, and we have some unknown function, which we know belongs to this class. And think about it as, you know, some, um, the class of linear functions or, or some highly structured um, way for algorithm for us to, to decide which, you know, which is the case, a cat or not a cat. And here, um, you know, in the typical setting, we have um, samples, but also another very common model is that of when we have the query access to F. And in our sense, these are quantum queries, so we are allowed to make them in superposition uh, via the, the standard uh, query uh, oracle. And the goal, since we can't expect to exactly um, predict it, so we want to probably approximately learn it. So what do I mean by that? We want with some um, very high probability, think about one minus delta for some uh, small constant delta, to output some circuit that will approximate uh, F very well. And that I mean on all but an epsilon fractions of the input. Okay, so I want to stress that for our result, because we want to show that uh, given a learning um, algorithm, we can derive circuit lower bounds, so we actually, it's for our interventions to have like stronger and stronger algorithms, because the more um, expressive algorithms we allow, the, the more um, power we have to show lower bounds. And so this is why query is better than samples. And in fact, we also allow um, more generally, instead of like just outputting um, a classical circuit, we can output a quantum circuit, U, and the quantum circuit um, will essentially, you know, you just like feed it with the, the input and, and some ancillas. And uh, just we want that with high probability, if we will measure, um, we will get the correct answer, except uh, in, in small uh, probability of error. Okay. So, um, so here comes the, the, the big questions that we want to ask. And that's, can quantum queries really help us? And the point is that so far, very little is known. So we don't have any strong results, uh, general results regarding the power of quantum learning um, algorithms in the setting of queries. And what we do know is that many of the classical uh, negative results, they no longer hold. And on the other hand, we have ample of examples how quantum query algorithms can admit lots of speed ups. Um, and since in our setting, even having a small, meager, um, speed up could imply interesting lower bounds, then, you know, having the, the typical uh, polynomial time speed up could be something quite exciting. Um, okay, so this raises um, a fundamental question, which 
is a quantum learning speedups possible at all, any sort. For example, something that would be very interesting is can we um, learn TC0 circuits, as I mentioned before, these special um, circuits in quantum time, which is nearly exponential, but it's, you know, 2 to the n over 2. Okay. And to formally state um, our result, what we show, uh, fairly formally, uh, so the main theorem shows that if a class C of polynomial size uh, concepts and polysized circuits can be learned with L, which is, um, you know, at most half minus gamma, and think about it like you can always learn things trivially with um, like L half, so you want to have this like distinguished advantage um, gamma, and we want to do it in quantum time, uh, which is little o of gamma squared um, 2 to the n over n, so just slightly better than uh, the, this exponent, then BQE is not contained in C. Right, so this is, to the best of my knowledge, this, this is the first general connection that we have between quantum algorithms and uh, complexity theory. And I want to illustrate this, uh, this theorem with an example just to give a better sense. So um, I mentioned these depth two threshold circuits. Um, so if we um, can learn them in quantum time, which is just little o of two to the n over n, already we have like new exciting circuit lower bounds. And so the, the, the main message I'm communicating here is that even minor algorithmic progress can lead to a major progress in complexity theory. So I mentioned quantum, uh, like I mentioned trivial learners, and I want to say uh, just like something about the tightness of the result and what is, a quantum, what is a trivial quantum learner. So there are two trivial quantum learners. So what are they? The first one is, well, the and a rather silly one where we query everything. And so that means we actually query the entire true stable of F and then we know it precisely and there are no L's and, and nothing can be done. So this is the, the trivial setting. Um, and it leads to one extreme end, which means like time two to the n. And at the other end of the spectrum, uh, we can actually use um, non tri like not completely trivial, but uh, trivial in the sense that it assumes no structure. So we can use for yes something. Right? So we can use um, the, the famous um, circuit that we see in the Silvazirani, like for four yes sampling, where essentially we you know just take state, put it in uniform superposition, we query it. And at the end, um, we compute, um, like we apply some Hadamard, so we get um, the, the Fourier decomposition over the group GF2 to the end. Um, and the point is that uh, if we measure the state, then we are getting a Fourier coefficient with a mass that is corresponding to, um, like we'll get it with probability that corresponds to its mass. And the point is that you can show that you will get uh, with high probability, like there will always, uh, we will always see some Fourier coefficient with at least uh, weight, which is that, which is non-trivial. And so because the definition of Fourier coefficient is simply the correlation of a function with um, like a certain um, Fourier monomial, then just by outputting this monomial will give us some um, non trivial, some distinguishing, some small distinguishing advantage. And, and the point is that if you plug this into the previous statement, you'll see that um, any non trivial uh, quantum learner, any slight improvement on these two trivial learners will imply uh, circuit lower bounds. Okay. So, um, the rest of the time that I have, I want to, I want to give you a very, very uh, quick proof overview, um, just like the, it's a very rough approximation just to give you some sense and mention a couple of uh, open problems. So the idea is that we have three steps. The first step talks about taking quantum learners and obtaining quantum natural properties from them. So what are quantum natural properties? So um, the way I like to think about it is, is these are algorithms that can detect uh, between, and distinguish between structure and randomness. So, you know, what it roughly formally means, it's that uh, it's an algorithm that runs in time, um, which is polynomial in the size of its input, which is um, like a function.
function, it's a Boolean function. And what it does, it rejects the, the class, a certain class that we want. So it's a natural property for a circuit class C. And it accepts some dense set. So the way I kind of like to think about it is that, you know, um, because it's a dense set, it means that it would accept random, the algorithm would accept random functions, and it will reject functions that are, uh, belongs to the class. Now, the idea is that if we can quantum learn uh, C, we can show that we can distinguish um, functions in the class from a random function. And then the second step, uh, we show, um, in fact, the, the first conditional pseudo-random generator, which is secure against uniform quantum computation. And the idea is that um, assuming that um, P space is not contained in um, quantum time, which is two to the n over alpha or some alpha, then if we have this assumption, um, we can use it to full uniform quantum circuits. Now, um, of course, so, and, and the way that we do it is to say is by quantizing um, some several hardness simplification results, uh, primarily um, like the, the list, local list decoding algorithm of IJKW. And of course, you might say, well, we we'll want to prove non conditional lower bounds. So, so, how is it that we have, uh, so, so how do we get that if we have only a conditional PLG? And that's because uh, the last step, it's a win-win argument that if you never saw it, and this is something very nice, I think, the idea is that we show that, you know, suppose that P space is contained in BQ time n to the n to the alpha, to the n to the alpha. Then we can show that in that case, it's actually very easy to prove lower bounds um, by, um, you know, diagonalization, by, by simple um, tools. But then, so if that's the case, we win. We're happy we have um, a lower bound in a simple way. And if not, then it means that um, we can actually use, then we know that we can use our uh, pseudo-random generator to fool the natural property to hit a hard function. So um, what do I mean by that? And that will conclude the proof overview. So the idea is that we can take the pseudo-random generator and use it to generate the outputs of um, a function. Now, the, the gist here is um, that because the natural property is, is a quantum algorithm um, that is being fooled by the pseudo-random generator, then the algorithm will not ha has no way of distinguishing between, um, between that and, and random. And that means that, with, uh, that we can show that we'll actually hit a hard function which is outside of C. Um, the class that we actually care about. Okay, um, of course, there are a whole lot uh, more complications and, and even here I'm not presenting the full, um, uh, the accurate argument, but I'd be happy to discuss it more in the round table discussion. Okay, so let me just conclude by mentioning uh, some open problems, um, three of them. So the first one is, is the quite obvious one, is whether we can design non-trivial quantum learning in, in that setting. And you know, this is a way of hitting two birds with one stone. On the one hand, we, we get like new quantum learners, and we also win by having some nice um, new lower bounds. The second one is, um, can we show quantum natural properties against ACC0? In fact, if we have that, then this could, this by our methodology would lead to showing that um, BQE is not contained um, in ACC0, so that would be extremely interesting. And some directions, which again, I'd be happy to, to discuss, uh, are via toes polynomials, um, like by, we can, it's enough to consider uh, functions that can be um, approximated by toes polynomials or functions uh, that admit um, Boolean matrices uh, of a certain symmetric rank. So there are some concrete directions that one can um, attack it. And the last one is, well, can we design even stronger and better pseudo-random generators? Again, uniform quantum circuits. So this is the, the first uh, such um, PLG, but any improvement would have interesting uh, implications. Okay, thank you very much. 
Wonderful. Th thanks very much, Tom, for that extremely nice talk. Um, so we do still have a few minutes for questions. So uh, please do uh, ask any questions you have on Slack. Um, as uh, I don't see any there other than a, a question about what software is being used for the presentation, which I think has already been answered, um, I will maybe kick things off by asking a question myself. So it's concerning the first point that you mentioned at the end, the first open question about sort of pr promising directions for quantum uh, learning algorithms or algorithms for learning interesting classes of quantum circuits. So I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about particularly promising uh, areas to look for these things or, or directions one may may aim towards. Yes, th thank you. So yes, yeah, so the thing that I, I'd like to stress, uh, at least my perspective here, is that, you know, the, the downsides of getting into quantum algorithm is that uh, at first you think, wow, the power of quantum is amazing, but then you see that um, it's very, very hard to get these impressive show-like or sub-hidden group um, type of speed ups. But actually, to have small quadratic improvements, it's, it's quite common. Um, and, and for example, what I, I find very interesting is this, so there is this um, very interesting paper, which shows that you can take, uh, it's an approach for proving ACC zero lower bounds. And the idea is that um, you can consider functions that, be, that can be approximated by these nice um, those polynomials. And what's um, interesting to me is that it seems that something in the Fourier nature expansion of these uh, functions could potentially play nice with the things that quantum algorithms can do well. And so by proving this quantum natural property, uh, this object that, for example, you know, um, all of the, it's like some efficient algorithm, quantum algorithm, that on the one hand will reject um, things which are, can be like nicely approximated by this polynomial, and will accept um, random functions, that this would solve a problem that I'm very much invested in. So I, I find it very exciting. Thank you. Um, and while we were talking, there have been a couple of questions on Slack, which I think we'll have time for. And the first question is by Johannes Jakob Meyer, who actually asks, uh, related to your, your last answer, what is a torus polynomial? Is there a sort of summary you can give? Yeah, I mean, I, I can say it in, in a few words, and it would be better, I think, in, like, to do it maybe with pen and paper uh, in, the se in the session. But think about um, a Boolean function, and like in a simple setting, think about a um, function defined on the hypercube, um, whose codomain is the, the one dimensional total. So just like, you know, think about 0, 1, but it is connected uh, between 0 and 1. And um, it should do like satisfy, so, so this is why you can think about this as a toes, and it should satisfy certain, um, like uh, some certain properties. But the, the point is that um, it's it's kind of like approximating by uh, real functions, but slightly more expressive than that. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think in the interest of time, we have time for perhaps one last question. So. I was questioned by Itai Lei, who asks, uh, why does a dense set mean the same as a randomly chosen point? Are we in the situation where dense implies non-zero measure? So, so uh, that's an excellent question, and, and it doesn't. This is uh, me um, um, hiding some details behind the, the, the rug. Uh, the point is that, you know, the, the way I can, like, it's, if it's dense, then if you just say like, choose something at random, then you have some nice probability of hitting it. However, the, the actual argument is, is more involved and we don't, what we actually do is not exactly to, to hit, but rather we consider uh, a pair language, um, which um, is designed exactly to, to deal with that problem. Because another thing is that the quantum natural property that we're getting, if we are being precise, it's a promise natural property. So what does it mean? Like we reject things that are in the, um, the in the, the property, but it, and we will accept things which are um, far from it. But if it's right on the, the boundary, similarly as in property testing, we, we can't do anything. And then this introduces some um, difficulties. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And I think we'll bring the questions to a close there. So thank you very much, Tom, again, for a lovely talk. Um, and let's end this talk here. And um, perhaps now the uh, next speaker can get his slides set up and start sh sharing slides.